Well, now, after eight months of study, we come to the last part of Paul's letter to the Romans. I'm very sorry that we've come to an end. I trust you are. But it's been a very wonderful experience, and God alone knows what has happened in each of our hearts while we've gone through it. Now, I wondered very much whether to take this chapter this morning on Remembrance Sunday, and after much prayer, I felt that we must go straight ahead. And this chapter may not be unrelated to the war and the strife that we think of this morning. Romans chapter 16, then, is our final study in this series. I think it's lasted longer than any series we've had in Bible study, but Romans is perhaps the most wonderful part of the Bible. Chapter 16, then, this morning. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deaconess of the church at St. Crier, that you may receive her in the Lord as befits the saints and help her in whatever she may require from you. For she has been a helper of many, and of myself as well. Greet Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risk their necks for my life, to whom not only I, but also all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks. Greet also the church in their house. Greet my beloved Apinatus, who was the first convert in Asia for Christ, Greet Mary, who has worked hard among you. Greet Andronicus and Junius, my kinsmen and fellow prisoners. They are men of note among the apostles, and they were in Christ before me. Greet Ampliatus, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and my beloved Stachys. Greet Apelles, who is approved in Christ. Greet those who belong to the family of Aristobulus. Greet my kinsman Herodion. Greet those in the Lord who belong to the family of Narcissus. Greet those workers in the Lord, Tryphena and Tryphosa. <laughs> Greet the beloved Persis, who has worked hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, eminent in the Lord, also his mother and mine. Greet Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Patrobas, Hermes, and the brethren who are with them. Greet Philologus, Julia, Nereus, and his sister, <coughs> and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. I appeal to you, brethren, to take note of those who create dissensions and difficulties in opposition to the doctrine which you have been taught. Avoid them. For such persons do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own appetites. And by fair and flattering words they deceive the hearts of the simple-minded. For while your obedience is known to all, so that I rejoice over you, I would have you wise as to what is good, and guileless as to what is evil. Then the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Timothy, my fellow worker, greets you. So do Lucius and Jason, and so Sipita, my kinsman. I, Tertius, the writer of this letter, greet you in the Lord. Gaius, who is host to me and to the whole church, greets you. Erastus, the city treasurer, and our brother Quartus, greet you. Now to him who is able to strengthen you. According to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret for long ages, but is now disclosed, and through the prophetic writings is made known to all nations, according to the command of the eternal God, to bring about obedience to the faith, to the only wise God be glory forevermore, through Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Our gracious God and eternal Father, we thank thee for every new truth we have understood as we have searched this book together. And now as we come to this final chapter, in which at first sight we may not see very much of value, we ask that thy Holy Spirit will once again surprise us with new truth, new insights, fresh discoveries of thy will and thy ways through thy word. We thank thee that when we have come with an open mind and a responsive heart, we have never been disappointed. And now we are met as thy people, 
we are hungry, we have an appetite for spiritual things, and we look to thee now to be fed, and ask that in thy gracious mercy thou wilt look upon us in pity, and grant us that which we need to know. And so with the psalmist we pray, open mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Through Jesus Christ our Lord we ask it. Amen. Now there's one member of the congregation who saw me a few days ago and said, I've just read through Romans 16 and I don't know what you're going to get out of it on Sunday. Well, I'll try to get something out of it rather than put something into it. But it's there in the Word of God. And God saw fit to put it in. I don't think it will surprise you when I tell you that some of the earliest copies of Paul's letter to the Romans circulated without this chapter. As if somebody thought, well, that chapter has nothing to say, so we'll cut it off and send the rest round. But the more I looked into this chapter, the more I felt it has something to say. Mind you, it's not the sort of chapter that you enjoy reading aloud. It's one of those full of names that uh, ties your tongue in knots. And indeed, in private Bible study, many people skip this chapter when they come to it. It's rather like those chapters with all the begetting in it. You know, begat, beg, begat, begat, so-and-so, so-and-so, so-and-so. It's just seemingly a long list of names, none of whom we, we know personally, most of whom are quite unknown to us from the rest of Scripture. And one wonders, why did God allow this chapter to stay? Why is it part of his word? and not just part of Paul's letter. The reason is to be found in the Apostles' Creed, the statement of faith that Christians have used now <coughs> for at least 1,600 years. When you recite that statement of faith which summarizes the fundamentals of Christian belief, you will come to this statement, I believe in the communion of saints. And if there is one message in chapter 16, it is the communion of saints. It is at this point that the message leaves the pulpit and travels to the pew. It's at this point that it ceases to be a matter of preaching and becomes people. The church is people, individuals, ordinary people, not just the great ones like Paul, but the unknown ones like Sosipater, whoever he was. And it is at this point that all that Paul has tried to say in Romans is transferred to the communion of saints. It is a roll call of Christian friendship. And there is a great deal to learn from a study of this roll call. And so let's go through the greetings which he gives. There are four kinds of greetings. First of all, he commends someone who is even now traveling to Rome and is going to arrive there as a stranger. And he's going to tell them how Christians should receive each other. And then he has a bunch of greetings for people who are already in Rome, who are known to him, and he wants them to greet these friends on his behalf. Then thirdly, he speaks of people who ought not to be welcomed into their fellowship. Christian welcomes can be too wide. Christian fellowship can be too tolerant. And he has a rather stern little warning here about those who should be avoided in Christian fellowship. And then finally, he sends the greetings of those who would love to come but can't because they have duties elsewhere. Here we have four kinds of greeting. And though it was customary to finish a letter in those days with such greetings, Paul seems to fill them with a, a meaning and a depth that an ordinary letter just cannot convey. I have noticed that when I receive a letter from an ordinary person, they either sign it yours faithfully or yours sincerely, or some formal signature like that, but when I get a letter from a Christian, it's always different. There's a greeting at the end, but it may be yours in him, yours OHMS, yours in the Lord, or it's something. And the greeting becomes an extraordinary thing. And these greetings become an extraordinary message in the hands of Paul. We start then with the first greeting, which is really a commendation of someone who's going to come to Rome. And the amazing thing is that he starts with a woman. 
not just because it's ladies first, but because in fact the postman of the letter to the Romans was a woman. I wonder if she realized how precious was that parchment roll attached to her body as she walked or traveled the many miles from Corinth to Rome. I want you to notice this. In Confucianism, women are only just tolerated. They are regarded as necessary for the prolongation of the race and nothing more. In Buddhism, a woman has no soul unless she happens to be reborn in the next life she has as a man. The Brahmins regard women as degraded creatures and will stop reading the Hindu, Hindu scriptures when a woman passes their door. The Muslims say that if a woman ever gets to heaven it will be because she has married and become a man's servant and will squeeze in as his servant. It waited for the Christian faith to lift womanhood to her rightful place and wherever the Christian gospel has been preached woman has been given her place. I saw this in Arabia where still to this day girls are sold for 75 pounds in the marketplace taken into someone's home with three or four others and treated as part of the bedroom furniture and kept in that room until they die. And you realize just how much Christian preaching and living has done for the female of the species. And here right at the top of these greetings is a woman. And there are some very wonderful things said about her. But I mention that it's a miracle of grace that in these greetings a third of the names are women's names. And from the very beginning the Christian church has had a vital place for women and has depended upon their ministry and given them a status that no other religion in the world has given. In Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female. And that has been the honor and status given. That does not mean that she has been given the same function. Men and women are different in function, inside the church as outside the church. There are things I can do in our home, and I'm often called upon to do, men fuses, stick up shelves. There are things that women can't do. There are things that my wife can do, she had the three children, I didn't, that I couldn't begin to do. And it's ridiculous to talk about equality of function, but equality of honor and status is a Christian thing. Now look at this woman's name. It is a Greek name, it is a Gentile name, and it is an idolatrous name. It's the name of the moon goddess worshipped in Greece. And here we have a woman whose background has been pagan. A woman who was brought up with no sound of the gospel in her home. She did not know Christ. And now she is a deaconess in the church. Furthermore, look at the place she came from. You would not have liked to talk to a woman who came from Sancrié. It was the dock area of Corinth. Everything immoral that happened, happened in Sancrié. The sailors came ashore and looked for women. And right in that place, Phoebe was a deaconess, doing rescue work, as Spurgeon's poem put it, within a yard of hell. And I can imagine this deaconess called Phoebe walking those streets at night, seeking to talk to the women who were standing around waiting for the sailors at the dockside. That's the background. Can you see something of the picture emerging of this woman who was given the priceless privilege of delivering this letter to the church in Rome? Now there are three facts listed about her. Fact number one, she is a sister. A sister. That's the relationship into which she's been brought by Christ. Since we are now sons and daughters of one father, we are brothers and sisters of one another. This, again, is a miracle of grace. It's not a relationship of flesh. It's a relationship of faith. And we meet together this morning, not as a group of individuals who are interested in religion, not as those who wanted to worship, and this happened to be the most convenient building, but as brothers and sisters. And this should show in our relationships Greet her as a sister in the Lord. How would you greet a long-lost sister? How would you welcome someone in the family? Then welcome Phoebe just like that. She's a sister. 
Secondly, she is a server. She has served the needs of others. And the word used is deaconess. Now let me underline this. I believe that in the early New Testament church they had deacons and deaconesses, both to serve in the name of the Lord to meet the practical needs of the people of God, deacons and deaconesses. Timothy mentions, or Paul mentions both in his letter to, the Tim, to Timothy. He mentions the qualifications for a male deacon and a female deacon, and he lists them both. And every church should have deacons and deaconesses. It's vital. You know, deaconesses can serve people in a way that deacons can't. I have noticed that when I go and visit a sick person, I sit down very properly and talk to them. And then a lady from the church calls, happens to call on when I'm there. And her approach is completely different. She doesn't sit down and talk. She goes and pats the pillow. And she sits a person up. She's got a practical touch that us men just don't have. She sees what's needed. Something needs taking out to the kitchen. Something needs bringing in. A deaconess can do so much that a deacon could never do. And women have a ministry in the church that men just cannot fulfill. And Phoebe was a server. And the word in the Greek is a deaconess. The third thing, thing said about this lady is that she was a helper. The literal word is a succorer. And it means a champion of the oppressed. Someone who stands for the, the rights and the needs of those who cannot stand for themselves. It was a title given in Greece to a public official, an ombudsman in Greece, whose duty it was to look after the rights of aliens and strangers because no one else would. And the word succor means someone who will care for someone when no one else will. I have told you before, but let me tell you again of a deaconess up in Manchester, and she was asked or told about an elderly woman who lived alone in a one-room flat in the slums of Manchester, and who was utterly filthy, and no one would go near her. And this deaconess made up her mind that she would go and wash that woman. And she went, and she went into the home, and the smell was such that she could hardly stay. But she began the unpleasant task of cleaning the flat and the woman. And she came out onto the landing and was physically sick. But she went back in and continued with her task, came out and was sick again, went back in, and went back in until she got the woman clean. Now that's what a sucker means. It means someone who will serve someone else whom nobody else will serve. And Phoebe, this lovely woman, from this pagan background in the dockside area at Corinth is now a deaconess looking after people whom nobody else will touch. Isn't this a lovely picture emerging of this woman? A deaconess who has been given the task of going to Rome with this letter which we are reading this morning. These are just names when you read them first, but when you look more closely, the names step out of the pages and become real people, lovely people, Christian people, this is the communion of saints. Receive her, says Paul, and help her. She's helped a lot of others, now you help her. She has given others comfort and cleanliness, now you give her these things. She has gone into other people's homes to help them receive her into your home. She's a sister. She has served the Lord and many churches in their need. She's a server, a deaconess. Deacon means server. Deaconess means server. And she's a sucker, somebody who helps those whom nobody else will help. So you receive her as befits the saints. Now we come to the next group of names. People who are already in Rome, how does Paul know them? The answer is that all roads led to Rome. Just as people tend to drift to London from all parts of this country, so they tended to drift to Rome from all parts of the empire. And people you met away in Asia Minor, in Greece, in Crete, wherever you met them, sooner or later you met them in Rome. Isn't it amazing how often when you go to London you see someone that you met somewhere else? Just bump into them in London. And a lot of people had come to Rome whom Paul had known elsewhere. And he now lists them. How are you at remembering names? 
Now sometimes you can use a little dodge, I'm afraid I have to, I, I meet so many here and there and then I meet someone somewhere else and they remember me because in a meeting of 400 people they had one to remember, I had 400 and they come up and they say, you do remember me don't you? And uh, I have two dodges, either you say, how do you spell your name? <laughs> and um, then they say S-M-I-T-H and you feel a fool, <laughs> or else another one that I use is, and how are they all? <laughs> and then they say, well, Auntie Sonsa's all right, and you think, Auntie says, I've got it, <laughs> and it's there. But one person once said to, said to me, who all? <laughs> Back to my court, and I didn't know what to say. It's all for remembering names. I don't usually forget a face, but remembering names is difficult. One little dodge that I was told, which is helpful, it is when you hear a person's name, use it to their face a few times when you talk to them. And in using it to their face, you are linking it with them. You have said the name while looking at their face. That helps. But I'll tell you this. Paul remembered people from all over that he had met. How? I know the deepest secret for remembering a name, and I'll guarantee that you won't forget a name if you use this secret, and it is to pray for the people you've met. You don't forget the names of someone you pray for. It's as simple as that. And I often wonder how long Paul's prayer list was when you consider that he'd met people all over the eastern Mediterranean, and writing a letter he could rattle off 40 names just like that of people that he had known in a church miles away that he'd never been to, and he could just rattle off the names. I'm quite sure it was not due to any gimmick, but to the fact that he prayed for people he'd met. May I suggest as a little practice for you that when you come to the end of the day, that you pray for everyone new that you've met that day. You will find then you remember their names next time you meet, because you've mentioned them to the Lord. I think that lies behind this list. Well, now look at this list. Names? No, there's much more than names here. The first is the name of a married couple, Prisca and Aquila, or sometimes Luke, who used to love to use the familiar names, said Priscilla and Aquila, Priscilla being the more intimate form of the name Prisca. A married couple, by the way, the name Prisca means old-fashioned. Don't know what that tells you about her, but um, we're all old-fashioned in our faith doesn't mean we should be old-fashioned in other ways, but we are old-fashioned. We believe in a story 2,000 years old. But Prisca means old-fashioned. She was a very high-born Roman lady from the very top social bracket, and she married a humble Jew who made tents for a living, Priscilla. And this strange couple came together, and they got married before they were converted, before they were Christians. He was a Jew, and she adopted his faith. Though she was a high-born Roman lady, she became a Jewish proselyte, and they married. And they lived in Rome, but the emperor banished all Jews from Rome, and they moved to Corinth and set up a tent-making shop there. And one day there came a little Jew to Corinth, another tent-maker. And he came and he said, could I have lodgings with you and work off my board by making tents with you? And they said, yes, we need help, come on in and they invited Paul into their home. They didn't know what that was going to do. And it was purely through a business connection, through the tent making, that they met Paul. And this married couple got converted, and they became a lovely married couple. I notice that most times when they're mentioned together, she's mentioned first. I don't know what that means. It's quite contrary to tradition then. Was it because she was high-born? Was she the most dominant personality? Did he get called Mr. Priscilla? I don't know. But she's always mentioned first. But I notice this. They are never mentioned separately. Isn't that wonderful? Here we have a picture of a husband and wife, a perfect team, a partnership. They are in it together. And there is nothing can hold a marriage together so much as being partners in the Lord's work. It gives an interest and a depth to a marriage that nothing else can give. Aquila and Priscilla, look at the things they did together. They opened their home to the church, and the church met in their home. And this is recorded not only in Rome, but in Corinth and elsewhere. Everywhere they went, their home became the church. Christians came into it. Thank God for Christian couples whose homes are the church 
and are open to Christian people. They risked their necks for Paul's life. A married couple so humble, so simple, and yet they were prepared to die for the gospel. What a wonderful couple is emerging from this little picture. We notice too that they left grateful people everywhere they went. Paul says, not only am I thankful for this couple, but all over the Gentile churches, there are people who thank God for the day this married couple came into their lives. If every married couple in the church was like this, what a church we'd all be. A home wide open to the, to the Christians. People who are prepared to risk their lives for the gospel. People who together are fellow workers in the Lord. People who leave grateful people wherever they go. People who take a man like Apollos and take him into their home and give him Bible study and instruct him more fully in the way and correct him. Oh, I could speak a lot about these, this couple. But I must go on or we shall be right into 5 to 11. We must finish earlier this morning because of Remembrance Day. Uh, Pinetus. Paul says, my first convert in Asia. You always remember your first anything, don't you? I wonder how many of you have known the joy of your first convert. There is no joy like it for the Christian. The joy of seeing the first person come to Christ through you. It's a joy that many Christians haven't had, but I'm sure you could. If you were praying for someone desperately, if you loved them, if you desired more than anything else to win them for the Lord, you'd have the joy of being able to say like Paul, my first convert. But it was the first convert in Asia. It was even more exciting. It was new territory where the gospel had never been. It was virgin ground. And here was the beginning of a new church. The first men. It was a thrill for me in Berlin to meet the Aukers. And to meet the men who had murdered Nate Saint and who had baptized into the faith Nate Saint's son and daughter. He is the first convert and the first pastor among the Alka Indians. What a thrill. The first. And now there's a church growing among those savage Alka Indians. The first convert in Asia, Epinetus. What a thrill for Paul. Mary not to be confused with the other five Marys. But I notice this, that Mary was a Martha. It says she worked hard. I think it's a libel on Mary to think that she never helped in the kitchen. Mary did help in the kitchen with Martha. Mary just knew that there's a time and place for everything and that sometimes helping in the kitchen is not what's needed. And here's another Mary who's a Mary and a Martha combined. That's the ideal combination. And it says she worked hard for the Lord. That's a lovely tribute. Do you know that in this list, three people are said to work hard for the Lord, and they're all women. And do you know that the Greek word translated worked hard means to toil to the point of exhaustion. And here are three women who are prepared to work to the bone for the Lord. It's a lovely tribute in one sentence. Thank God for women in the church who are prepared to work to exhaustion for the sake of the Lord. Andronicus and Junius, of them four things are said. They are kinsmen of Paul. That means they are Jews. They have been in prison with Paul. What an experience to have. Would you like to go to jail with Paul? You'd never forget it. You'd be singing songs at midnight apart from anything else. But what an experience to go to jail with Paul, my fellow prisoners. They are of note among the apostles. And that almost certainly means that they were apostles themselves, not that the apostles thought highly of them, but that they were great apostles. And we realize, therefore, that there were more apostles than the twelve. There were many others. Andronicus and Junius are two. Barnabas was another. An apostle is a sent one. And in Latin, a sent one is mitio, mitere, missionary, missionary. And the word missionary today is the same as the word apostle. Someone sent out to preach the gospel in a new area. And these two were missionaries. 
They had been in prison with Paul as missionaries. They were fellow Jews, and Paul says they were Christians before I was. They must have been converted very near the beginning, if not on the day of Pentecost, because Paul was converted soon after Stephen's martyrdom, and these two perhaps had been among the 500 that saw the risen Lord and could claim that authority for their apostleship. Ampliatus, if that's the right pronunciation, I know nothing about him, except that a market gardener outside the city of Rome some years ago dug with his spade and hit something hard and pulled the soil away and discovered a family tomb, and on it was the name of this man, and the date of the tomb was the date of this letter, and the household was the household with which they've been able to link the name, so a market gardener found the tomb of this man just a few years ago. Urbanus means belonging to the city and was a very common name in Rome and I know nothing about him or Stachys or Apelles. Aristobulus now, there's an interesting name, the grandson of Herod the Great and the brother of Herod Agrippa and here he is in Rome, a Christian. The next name, Herodian, is probably a relative for that reason. Narcissus was a slave and so you've got high-born ladies and slaves in this list. Tryphena and Tryphosa, you'll be interested in them. They were twin sisters. If you ever get two names like this, with the same beginning of the word, it means they were twins. And here we have two ladies' names, twin sisters, and in English, their mother called them dainty and delicate. And I want you to imagine these two little girls, dainty and delicate, growing up together in the home, twin sisters. But you know what it says of them? They worked to the point of exhaustion for the Lord. Dainty and delicate, they worked to the point of exhaustion. Doesn't that give you a lovely picture? Some ladies are so dainty and delicate, they'll never dirty their hands. They'll never do anything for others. They want to be served and waited on. They want maids around them. Dainty and delicate, working to the point of exhaustion for the Lord. Do you know it's the Lord who does that to people? and takes dainty and delicate ladies and makes them workers in the church. Again, there's a picture emerges that's real and up to date. Well, let's go on down this list. Persis means a Persian woman and therefore was almost certainly a slave girl. Rufus means redhead. Whether he had red hair or not, his father had a black skin. For his father was an African there came a day when Jesus carried the cross up Golgotha and because he'd been flogged and starved, Jesus fell. And the Roman soldier looking around for someone to carry the cross knew that he couldn't make a Jew carry it or a Roman and he saw an African from what is now Libya, Simon of Cyrene. And Simon the nigger, as he's called in the scripture, carried the cross up Calvary. Years later, Simon the nigger is mentioned in Acts 13 as one of the leaders of the church at Antioch. But it is Mark who tells us that Simon of Cyrene, the black African who carried the cross, was the father of Rufus and Alexander. What a romance behind that name. And Paul says, Rufus's mother was a mother to me, no doubt in Antioch. Paul was not married. Have you ever wondered who darned his socks? Who did his washing for him? These are practical questions. Who did it? I think the mother of Rufus did it while he was in Antioch. Paul said, she was a mother to me. She darned my socks, she did my washing. And so you get a picture emerging of people doing practical things for each other, all bound together in one family, whether black or white doesn't matter. They're all one in Christ Jesus. Asyncretus, Phlegon, Hermes, Patrobas, Hermas, and the brethren. I know nothing about this except that their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life as well as in this book. And when every copy of this book is destroyed by fire, as everything belonging to this world will one day, the names of these people will still be in another book where your names are written alongside theirs in the Lamb's Book of Life.
Philologus means someone who's fond of talking. I think we've got the modern counterparts of that in the pew as well as the pulpit. Uh, Julia, Nereus and his sister, Nereus was the chamberlain of the Emperor Flavius and Domitilla, Olympus and all the saints. What are we going to say about a list like this? I just want to shout hallelujah. I just want to point out that in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, for both are here. I want to point out that in Christ there is neither bond nor free, for both are here. I want to point out that in Christ there is neither male nor female, they're both here. And it is an amazing tribute to the mixture contained within the Christian church, this list in this Romans 16. You're beginning to see something in Romans 16 now. A church in which there is no division of class, no division of race, no division of civic status, no division of sex, no division whatsoever but a church in which anybody may find a true home in Christ Jesus. wonder if you realize that this is not a relic of the past, this list, for these people are not dead. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Those who have trusted in him are living to the Lord, and we are reading part of the membership role of Christ Church today. These people are resting in glory with the Lord and one day we shall meet them. This is a list of friendships that you will make in heaven. It's not a list of some dead names from long ago. It is a list of living Christians who are alive unto the Lord this very Sunday morning. They are separated from us by the veil of death, but it's only a veil to Christians. And when we say, I believe in the communion of saints, it means quite simply that I am in communion with Rufus and with Alexander, with Prisca and Aquila, with Phoebe. I'm in communion with them because they are in one hand of Christ, I am in the other. The church militant on earth, triumphant in heaven is one church. I believe in the communion of saints and I'm looking forward to meeting these people in heaven and talking to them. That's why they're there. These are members of our church. We are members of their church. We are all in Christ. And do you notice again and again they are said to be in Christ, in the Lord, in Christ, in the Lord. It doesn't really matter what your address is. It matters not whether you live in Rome or Corinth or Chalfon St. Peter or whatever. The real question is do you live in Christ? If so, then you are part of the church to which these people belong. I believe in the communion of saints and mystic sweet communion with those whose rest is won and these people have won their rest in glory now. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Now you discussed this at the women's evening group about a month ago I gather and I heard that one lady among us said she was all for it. <laughs> and I gather you came to a conclusion that it meant a handshake. Well, I'm very sorry, but I'm going to disagree strongly with that conclusion. What did Paul mean when he said, greet one another with a holy kiss? He certainly didn't mean the normal form of greeting, or he wouldn't have defined it. He would just have said, greet one another. If he simply meant the normal way you greet another person, then greet them like that, he'd simply have said, greet them. He wouldn't have told them how to greet them. He would have left them to do it the normal way. A holy kiss was not the normal way of greeting. Indeed, it would have been misunderstood outside those who were physically related. The kiss then as now, outside of Christ, was an expression of an intimate relationship of flesh and blood. And Paul is saying, you are brothers and sisters, treat one another as that. But he had to add this qualification. Not only could this greeting be misunderstood outside, it could be abused inside. And he said, make sure that it's holy. That's why he put the word holy in. And you know, I saw more of this kind of thing at Berlin than I've ever seen at any gathering of Christians. I saw men flinging their arms around each other, cheek to cheek, and it was a holy thing that could be misunderstood 
and regarded as immoral anywhere else outside of Christ. And indeed the early Christians were often accused of immoral orgies in their love feasts precisely because they went further than normal decency would have allowed in secular society. But Paul is saying, as brothers and sisters in Christ, you can show your affection to a greater degree, but make sure that it's holy and free from any unworthy thoughts or motives. Why shouldn't Christians show their affection more deeply? They are more deeply related even than flesh and blood. And so Paul says, show your affection, show that you're a family, show one another that you love you, each other, show it. Greet one another with a kiss, which is a very intimate form. You know the most unholy kiss that ever took place in history? Judas, do you betray me with a kiss? That was the most unholy kiss of all history. But Peter's, Paul says, greet one another with a holy kiss. And 1 Peter 5, which is our next Sunday evening study, also says greet one another with a holy kiss. Christians could go beyond others in showing affection one for another. But it must be real, it must be understanding, it must be holy when it is done. It was partly this that made the early world say, see how these Christians love each other, and made some others say, you know, it's all sexual, it's all immoral, it's an orgy. Their love feasts, they're dreadful things, you know, you should see what they do. But you see, when an unholy man when an immoral man sees two men in church embracing, he only reads into it his own foul thinking. He cannot see that this is a holy love that has bound these men together, a holy love that makes them express their affection one to another. Now, I suppose this is one of the hardest things for P Christians in Britain to do. We're so dreadfully reserved and shy, and yet the depth of our fellowship does reach points where we want to show affection. And I saw many people of different races, different backgrounds, even different languages who couldn't speak to each other in words, with their arms around each other at Berlin, loving each other in Christ. And it was holy and it was not immoral. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Now let me go on to the warning. And our time, I'm afraid, is running right out. Paul says there are some people you shouldn't welcome. Your fellowship is a lovely thing and I, I'm jealous for you. I don't want you to lose it. Paul says, there are some people who when they get in among you, they disturb, they divide, they cause difficulties, they make parties, dissensions. Take a note of them and avoid them. They divide you. And anything that divides Christians is wrong. And Paul says, take a note of people like that. Don't turn them out and don't turn on them. Just turn away. The only treatment for someone who divides a fellowship and breaks it up into sects and parties is the silent treatment, the cold shoulder. Paul says, I want you to welcome each other with affection, but watch those who will come in and divide. They not only divide, they deceive the simple members, the simple-minded. They deceive the hearts with fair and flattering words. They are gullible. Sanctimonious Kent is one of the modern translations of this phrase. And they are devilish. It is the devil who desires to divide the fellowship. It is Satan who wants to split Christians. It is the devil who wants to take a fellowship and break it into fragments. And Paul says, I want you wise in things that are good and guileless, innocent in things that are evil. There is a kind of thinking and speaking today which says, if you want to be sophisticated, you must have knowledge of evil as well as good. You must be as wise about evil things as you are about good things. You must know as much about sin as you know about holiness. If you want to be mature, if you want to be sophisticated, grown up. Paul says, as far as good things go, I want you to know them inside out. I want you to be wise. As far as sin goes, I want you to be utterly innocent and without knowledge. 
You don't need to know all that much about sin to keep away from it. You don't need to have tasted all the lusts of the flesh to know their danger. Sometimes a Christian wishes he did. Have you ever wished that you'd been a cannibal or a criminal before you'd been a Christian? Have you ever wished you'd been down in the mud? Have you ever thought, if only I'd been a dreadful person, I would have such a wonderful testimony? Just thank God that in some areas of evil you're innocent and that you were saved from that. You see, the basic sin of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil was just this, that they wanted knowledge of evil as well as knowledge of good. That's the symbolic meaning of that tree. And they were listening to the serpent who said, you know, if you want to grow up, you'll have to have knowledge of both. If you want to be sophisticated, if you want to be mature, you'll have to taste everything. You'll have to have personal experience of evil as well as good. Paul says, look, I want you to have no experience of evil. I want you to be guileless. And the words he uses are identical with the words of our Lord. Wise as serpents, but harmless, guileless as doves. And he says, if you do this, if you avoid those who would divide your fellowship, God will crush Satan beneath your feet and the devil will not get a foot into your church. The clock has gone against me this morning. I'll have to finish off Romans altogether, I think, next Sunday morning with a kind of refresher course and look back over the whole epistle and see the way that God has led us. Let us pray. Our gracious God, we thank thee that the fellowship of thy church has room for everyone, that thy love is so great that it is not only for all but for each. And we praise thee for the wonderful mixture of people we have here. And we pray now that the devil may never get in to divide or disturb, to cause dissension or difficulty. And we ask that thou wilt crush Satan beneath our feet in this matter and enable us with that harmony that comes from the Lord Jesus to lift up one voice in praise to thee. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.